first time I went diving. Oh my gosh. The ocean is what this planet is made of. I sure wish that more people could have that experience, but realistically, that's not possible. Therefore, thank goodness, we have the medium of film. Howard Hall and I make underwater wildlife films for a living. My name is Michelle Hall and I am a filmmaker, still photographer, organizer, a nurse. When I was a kid, I was fascinated with animals. I had a pet skunk <laughs> that had not been descended, a porcupine for a little while. I used to go out and take a baby crow out of the nest every year and raise it and then it would fledge and go off. I wanted to be an explorer and the underwater world was one place you could still discover new things where there was animals that had never been seen by humans and there was places that no human had ever gone. And that's what inspired me to go diving and learn to dive and to eventually make underwater films. Michelle and I probably couldn't be any more unalike. I grew up in the city. My parents were not outdoors people. Our idea of a family vacation was going to South Florida and checking into one of the big hotels and sitting at the swimming pool. My exposure to wildlife as a child was almost non-existent. What I wanted to do in life was be a nurse. I accomplished that dream, and I worked as a nurse for 19 years. So how did I get to be a filmmaker? And when I was in nursing school, we went to the Ozarks on our senior trip. We were given the opportunity to have a practice session scuba diving in the swimming pool at the resort that we were staying at. And I said, no way am I going to do this. No way am I going to go underwater and breathe off something on my back and have that as my life support. She had no knowledge whatsoever of the natural world before she met me. And to her credit that she was crazy enough to want to take diving lessons when she was a, a young adult. Fortunately, she took diving lessons from me. <laughs> and what a pivotal day in my life, May 5th, 1975. The Monday night, I walked into my dive class. He was my diving instructor. I really didn't understand what his passions were about when we first met. I remember standing there shortly after my first experience in the ocean and feeling a sense of privilege because I knew I had experienced what was under there. And I hoped that I would someday be able to travel and see what lived in the oceans around the world. If I have any major talent, uh, it's in knowing what animals are going to do before they do it. 
if you think about it, you have to have that camera running before the animal does whatever it is you want it to do. And when we're making IMAX movies, the camera is loaded with only three minutes of film. So if you're gonna get animal behavior, you have to turn the camera on at a cost of about $60 a second, and you have to have it running when the animal decides to do it. When we were doing our first IMAX 3D film, which was called Into the Deep, we filmed two fish doing a threat display where the, these are male fish that come out and they open their mouths and they do this. And I was watching these fish, I instinctively thought they're gonna do it now. And I turned the camera on, it rolled for 10 seconds and they did the display. And I thought, wonderful, I got it. I moved the camera to a different location, set it up, waited for another half hour or so. Thought, now's the time, turned it on and they did it again. They did it four times on a three minute roll of film. That's one of my talents, is having almost infinite patience and guessing right often about when fish are going to do something interesting. That comes from being interested in wildlife when I was a kid. I've watched wildlife and studied wildlife my entire life. Many thousands of hours actually diving and looking at fish. I just identify with them enough to where I can guess what they're going to do a bit before they do it. making our film under the sea 3D. We were working on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. The shot that we wanted to get was a stonefish preying on a reef fish. Stonefish is buried in rubble. We were waiting for a fish to swim over the top of this stonefish and hopefully the stonefish was going to attack it. We waited for six hours for that shot. <laughs> and it was the coldest uh, my crew says they've ever been. And we've dived in the Arctic and we've dived in British Columbia. But eventually the fish swam over the stonefish and it was attacked by the stonefish. And I could hear a collective horrified sigh behind me as everybody went, oh no. <laughs> and I thought, well actually, you know, that actually works better for the story than if the fish gets eaten. I could never kept my crew down there for another five or six hours anyway. Sometimes you have the opportunity to really interact with some amazing creatures in the sea. I had an experience that really was life-changing. We were in the Sea of Cortez working on a, a film project. We had our whole film crew and I had gone in to make a dive and take some photographs. Just as I was ascending, I saw a manta ray swim by. This was a Pacific manta ray. He was probably about 18 feet wingtip to wingtip. He was quite, quite a big guy. And I could see that there was a trail of fishing line that was caught on the manta ray's mandible. And it just came up and sort of hovered below me. The films that Howard and I make are just wildlife behavior, no people in it. But we had this wonderful collaboration going with Greg McGilvery. When we made Coral Reef Adventure, I wanted it to be real. I wanted to do something that challenged our crew and challenged me, and frankly, scared us a little bit. And so what we decided to do was to dive deeper than anybody had ever operated an IMAX camera before, and to go places that nobody had ever been with an IMAX camera. And 
That entailed uh, diving to below 100 meters, breathing exotic gases, helium, oxygen, and nitrogen. It required developing technologies that didn't exist. It's very similar to the systems the astronauts use when they're in outer space. Uh, it basically, it takes the gas that you're breathing, purifies it, and recycles it. We knew that there was a very significant chance. a few feet and I was very confused. I couldn't begin to imagine why. I turned around and went back down. So I was at 50 feet, I descended to 70 feet. When I hit 70 feet, it was like somebody flipping off a switch and the pain was gone because whatever bubbles were causing the problem in my nervous system, uh, they compressed to where they weren't causing the problem anymore. I continued on down to 100 feet and I resumed a decompression profile that uh, allowed me to get to the surface. He came to the surface and didn't really talk about anything being wrong. And then we were busy doing other things and getting on with what our plan was for the rest of the day. We made a couple more dives. He never commented about not feeling well. Nobody else said anything to me because, God forbid, they should tell the wife that maybe something was wrong. I had something that I needed to ask Howard, and as soon as I opened the door, I knew something was wrong. He then told me that he had had some difficulty coming back from that first dive of the day. The potential severity of it really hit me when he started stumbling as he was walking down the hallway because I realized that he was beginning to lose function of his legs. I started having major symptoms of paralysis and huge discomfort. I talked with somebody from Divers Alert Network. He was concerned that Howard might not ever be able to dive again. And I just thought, that's going to break this man. We began a whole protocol that we had devised for treating decompression sickness in the water. The gear that we were diving with, closed circuit rebreathers, allowed us to stay down long enough to actually treat the disease. Half my brain's saying you're the nurse and you're the producer and you need to make this happen for him to be safe and the other half is saying, that's my husband down there and I don't know what's gonna happen. around and there's storms off from where we are and I'm just thinking we can't be out here in the midst of a storm and we have to stay until this in-water recompression is finished. One of the amazing things that night was it was lightning and it was storming all around us and we had clear sky above our heads. Three hours later, he was back on the boat. Had we not done that, he wouldn't be walking and doing the diving and everything else that he's able to do today. We ended up going to a decompression chamber in Suva, Fiji, 
and I spent uh, a few days there getting treatments. Howard was adamant once he got the clearance from the doctors, he was, yeah, of course I'm gonna go back down. We had 10 more successful dives deeper than 350 feet, and it was all fine after that. All those precautions uh, saved me from having any permanent damage because it was a major hit. My particular job is trying to show the world what a beautiful place the ocean environment it is. We want to build a sense of value for these environments and the animals so that people learn to love them a little bit. It may be unfortunately, that in 100 years there won't be any sharks and there won't be any manta rays and people will be looking at the films that I've made to see what those animals were like. I hope that's not true. I hope rather that my films are discarded and long gone because 100 years from now, people will be able to go out and go diving and see the same things that I've seen.